and looking at the kinds of societal transformations, political, economic, and social transformations needed to enable agroecology as a pathway towards a more just and sustainable food system. So we're going to present on some of that work today. There's four of us from that group who are going to talk about some work that we've been doing. Um, particularly over the last year, we were asked by the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, to do help them with some thinking about of what they were about their scaling up initiative. And so, after um, kind of, I guess maybe flirting with the idea of agroecology for some time, they've been over the last five years kind of thinking seriously about how the FAO can can look at agroecology and enable it and scale it up within the FAO, but also globally. And so we're gonna, that's the work we're gonna talk about is our, our focus on um, transformations and transitions for a more just sustainable food system through agroecology. And so Jahi, Chilla, Michelle, and I will be kind of working through that together with you all. And today we're doing this as a part of a, a day where we're focused, uh, our People's Knowledge Day, so the people, folks that are here who are around for the rest of the day will be kind of engaging with each other around uh, thinking about, for example, how people's knowledge <coughs> is important in social transformation. Um, and so if this is a space for us to, to kind of support each other in, in that work as well. So well, welcome to that day and I uh, encourage you to, to come and participate in some of the, the kind of other things we have, which is basically just make, taking time to, to speak with one another and to support each other in that work. So. Well, the definition we're working with is really agriculture as a science of a series of practice and, and movement. And within that, I think we emphasize greatly the importance of the indigenous knowledge, people's knowledge. Uh, it's very interesting that um, agroecology early on emphasized not just the science of ecology and complexity back in pre-World War II days, particularly in Mexico, but also emphasized the, the tremendous importance of intercultural dialogue with farming communities and indigenous people. So very early on, we had this idea that agroecology would marry and combine parts of Western science, i.e. ecology, and people's knowledge. And that's a very strong theme that we emphasize a lot in core, the, import, the centrality of people's knowledge in the making of agroecology, um, its practices, you know, from intercropping agroforestry to uh, local regional markets with consumers, uh, to policy change, the centrality of people's knowledge and their agency in agroecological transitions and transformations. And that's, I think, uh, quite a distinct part of core as well. Um, so with that, I won't say any more, because we'll revisit that theme and whatever is being said after. So, I hope this won't come as a surprise to anyone, but agroecology has really been growing in profile. Uh, there's various roots in agroecology, but people often draw especially on uh, work of a lot of Latin American agroecologists, but of course there's also roots around the world, both informally and formally, called agroecology or not called agroecology formally. Um, I, for example, think that the organic and the resistance against high modern farming in uh, England is another example of agroecology's roots. But it's been growing beyond just these original roots and sort of coming together globally. And there's been like 20, 20 or 30 major reports. And it's in The Guardian, uh, international organizations, places like CORE. Uh, the citations and publications in agriculture have been growing over the past decades. Use over, you can see it in uh, Google Ingram, all over. And one of the uh, contexts for the work we've been doing is, uh, as Colin mentioned, is that we were requested by the FAO to do some work on this. And we also actually did some work uh, for the Agroecology Fund, which is around 14 uh, charitable donors from Europe and the United States primarily that are supporting agroecology around the world. So it really has this growing profile, and the FAO is actually planning on spending um, $100 million uh, over the next 10 years on agroecology programs, and they're scaling up agroecology <coughs> together with other UN agencies. So it, it is an exciting and changing and growing context, as I think many of us are familiar with. And we're trying to scope out uh, how we can enable a transition to agroecology is, I think, becoming increasingly important and increasingly an object of study. Uh, we have colleagues around the world, but particularly in Ecosur, uh, University of Mexico has a group that specifically 
uh, based around Scaling Up Agroecology. That's the name of the initiative within the FAO, the Scaling Up Initiative. So these questions of how do we get agroecology to become the dominant system uh, with the values of practice, science, and movement that Michelle laid out, how do we maintain all those? And so that also leads to a discussion about not just how transition and transformation happens, but what's the nature of the transition and transformation. So there even is, of course, some really important debate around should we be using the term scaling up, which often implies some kind of hierarchy or consolidation or centralization, when agroecology really also has to be based in people's knowledge and local context, uh, in increasing equity, as we'll talk about, a number of other issues there. So scaling out is an alternative term sometimes emphasized to try and get around the idea of hierarchy or centralization, or the terms used by uh, many of our colleagues in uh, Mexico at ECOSUR and other, some other Latin American areas is uh, masificación or mastication. So it doesn't quite sound as good in, in English, I think, but also another way of trying to say the expanding without necessarily inherently changing the nature or recentralizing agroecology and agroecological knowledge. So that's the, the context for the work we've been doing around FAO, Agroecology Fund, and as well in our Agroecology Now group trying to continue this work and expand it. Right. So, um, you know, we, Michelle talked a little bit about what we mean when we talk about agroecology and the importance of people's knowledge and the importance of considering people's agency and power. But to us, the, uh, the notion of food sovereignty and people's control over decision making and the governance of food and agriculture is really important. And so when we were asked to think about what transition or what scaling up looks like for the, uh, for the FAO, for us it was is keeping all of those things central and always thinking about because agroecology is being filled with lots of different meanings and the, the, the ways that people engage with um, intervening or policy or um, activism or work um, to scale up is often coming from different places and different positions. So to us it was really central to, to kind of think about that. And so we started to... You've already mentioned some of the work of EcoSur. There's a number of different um, kind of uh, initiatives, um, thinkers, social movements, academics that are writing about um, things that are related to transitions and to transformations and scaling up. And so, uh, what we did is, as a group, uh, as we sat down and we looked through, as um, we did a search for everything that we could find on that, basically that's been written in the, in the academic and the non-academic literature. And we we ended up reviewing. Together as a group of uh, four, the four, five of us, Yannicka Broyle is, is another person that was a key part of that team who's not here and she works for a group called Cultivate um, in Europe. And we, uh, we looked through these, these 500 papers together and tried to make sense of them together through the different kinds of um, kind of some of the, the, the work that's been done on scaling up and massification and scaling up, try to make sense of these things together. And so over the course of a year, we've iter iteratively developed this um, this framework that we're presenting to you today, uh, which was through that collective process, but also we, through the, our work with the FAO, we brought together a group of five um, people from social movements and from, um, from academia, together with about 14 uh, staff members from the FAO to then workshop some of our ideas and to iteratively develop what ended up being the, what we're presenting today. And so that's the process that we've gone through and what we're, we're presenting. And for us, it's still a work in progress because a lot of this is, is um, kind of a journey, a long journey that many of us have been working on long before we came to this particular project. But um, this has been a nice way to consolidate some of our thinking. So one of the, one of the things that we started looking at was one of, uh, there, Steve Gleesman kind of came up with a framework for thinking about agroecology transitions and he proposed a five level framework and the first three levels focus on the farm level. The first level being farms increasing the efficiency of their farms um, to uh, be, be more ecologically sound. The second being that they begin to substitute inputs. So um, using the inputs that are more sustainable than the inputs used in, in other systems. And then the third level in this framework um, is the complete ecological, the redesign of farms based on agroecological principles. And without going into too much de detail on that, which you're welcome to follow up on, um, what we were, we were interested in that, but what we're also interested in is thinking about the kind of broader context and the broader transformations required to enable transitions of practices. And so he talks about a uh, level four and a five, and so level four is connecting agroecological farms with with markets and with kind of urban places. 
and level five being kind of everything else that, that's needed to be done, all the cultural, political, social transformations that are needed. And what we wanted to do was really focus on that kind of level four and five and to give it more nuance and really dig into that and how that has a role in shaping not just practice agroecological practices on farm, but for us, agroecology represents a paradigm shift around how food systems and society is organized. And so it's not just about just about on-farm practices, but around the, the kind of material practices of people around food and agriculture and what can be done to enable that. And so we started looking at, um, there's, in, there's a wider body of literature, or a different body of literature on sustainability transitions. And so it's um, looking at historically how transitions have happened, say in the energy, agriculture, different sectors of the um, economy. And one of the, and so you often it's, they're looking back at what happened and why and the different kind of dynamics of that. And one of the, um, for, for our study, one of the, the frameworks that we found useful to think of, to, to help us think through all the 500 kind of different papers we we're looking at in our emerging analysis um, was this idea of a multi-level perspective. And so the multi-level perspective at kind of at this very basic level is a way to think about how uh, in three levels thinking about how um, kind of economies, political economies and, and social technological networks function and that there are three kind of levels. And so the three levels are, the first is there's a dominant regime. And so these are the, the rules, the norms, the institutions, the policies, the dynamics that kind of hold the status quo and hold things in the current configuration. Um, on the other hand, there are emerging alternatives. What they refer to as niches, what we talk about is emerging alternatives and alternative paradigms and alternative initiatives that are quite different from the, what was happening in the dominant regime. And so for us, agroecology, and food sovereignty, and permaculture, some of these, ide these ideas that are emerging are possible alternatives to the dominant regime. And then the third level is the landscape level. And so these are broad, um, forces, societal forces that can't necessarily be immediately kind of influenced, but are really important to think about. For example, climate change being one, these massive forces that shift things in ways that really affect the relationship between the emerging alternatives and the, the dominant regime. And so what we wanted to focus on in particular was the relationship between emerging alternatives and the dominant regime, not just thinking about um, taking agroecology and scaling it up and how to do that, but really thinking about the relationship between the things that, that enable and disable that. And it's not just about scaling up, but it's about transforming if we want to think about transitions. So um, what we did is when we reviewed this literature, we, we through this process of working it out together, we um, decided to look at, in particular, that between the, the emerging alternatives in the regime, that there were particular areas that have somewhat fuzzy boundaries, but were able, we were able to define and are discrete, what we call domains of trans, transition or domains of transformation. And in each of those domains, what you have are factors that are enabling emerging alternatives and factors that are disabling in them. And they sit in between the regime and the niche. Um, and what we found is in a lot of the, the papers that um, often a focus would be, for example, on all the enabling things that are, that are lifting agroecological initiatives and alternatives up, or they would be focused on the things that were disabling them, but very rarely kind of looking at them together. And then also that we, we end up, and I'm going to pass it to Michelle in a second to talk about the six domains that we think are important to, uh, that emerge as important in our analysis. A lot of times people were focusing on one or two of those domains or maybe three, but not looking at it all together. And so what we wanted to do was, was kind of pose this, this kind of framework that allowed us to think more holistically about those <coughs> dynamics, the, the enabling and disabling factors within these domains, but also widen it out in terms of not just focusing on one or the other, but going beyond that. Michelle? Okay, okay so these these are the six domains we identified, equity, including gender equity, networks, local organizations and federations they form, discourse, our ideas are framed, um, knowledge and culture, systems with exchange, uh, meaning something broader than just money-based market, thinking about forms of economic exchange, 
vitally important access to land, seas, water, and biodiversity, and focusing very much on the practices. And as Colin has already said, we honed in on this representation of reality in order to think more holistically. And today, when we look back, we probably would say we've missed some bits. Yesterday, we were talking about the importance of maybe including financial markets. So this is work in progress. But the point is, is to go beyond the consideration of a single factor or a couple of factors, as you often see in the literature. Mm-hmm. Trying to sort of grasp this, <coughs> these moving parts in a, in a holistic, comprehensive, integrated manner. Because all of these domains shape agroecological trans- transitions and possibilities transformation. Uh, no? I have to do it this way. Um, now, underpinning all these domains, um, there's the question of governance. Um, you know, how, how decisions are made, how power is exercised, um, and where, where and when are those decisions made. Um, so, in our, in our thinking, power is, is, a, is a central concept um, in the same way that it has been for other groups like Ipesfri, who put power very much at the center of their thinking about lo- locking um, and, and locking out of um, um, uh, the, the current system. Um, so we've considered governance as power relationship, responsibility and accountability and quite deliberately taken a power structures perspective to think about what's happening at the household level, okay, gender relations, within the community, uh, going up to the national and international, and how these different um, decision-making arenas interact across scales. Because it's the combination of the actions of these different processes that determine what is possible by way of transitions or transformation in different domains that are listed. So we try to play with, with power governance in that way. And we go next to access to land, season biodiversity. So yeah, we're going to briefly go through each of those domains, uh, what we found from the literature, uh, specifically around their connection and importance and the enabling and disabling factors. So in terms of access to land, seeds, water, and biodiversity, or <coughs> Not not more than more than human nature more generally. Uh, this of course is something that uh, strongly affects whether or not agriculture can succeed, whether or not we can transform or transition towards an agri- agricultural system. If you don't have access to the very basic materials, you can't really survive. Even though agroecology, part of the element, uh, I think one of the pluses of it is that marginalized people often have a lot of agroecological knowledge still and it can uh, generate certain kinds of resilience, but we shouldn't mistake that ability to exist in a marginalized space for uh, being able to thrive. We really need to think about access, increasing access to different resources. So an example of land, which I would say is probably the best studied uh, area of this, uh, and has the most uh, largest evidence base, uh, there's actually a lot of connections found in the literature between secure land tenure and being able to invest in agricultural practices, being able to uh, maintain that knowledge base and grow it. And actually, particularly, the research points to redistributive land reform, not just sort of opening markets or privatizing land and giving titles, but also working with a variety of different governance regimes, dealing with power issues, as, as uh, Michelle mentioned. You really have to redistribute and think about power relationships. You can't just say, we're going to privatize or hand out some land without thinking about the power relationships. Otherwise, it doesn't really fulfill its potential. Um, but there's lots of interesting evidence for this. Uh, and it's very similar, I would say, with seeds, water, biodiversity, agrobiodiversity, that, uh, for example, the privatization of seeds and uh, biological resources through patents and things like that, a real obstacle, a disabling factor for agroecology. Um, at the same time, similar to land, there's a lot of traditional and still evolving. I, I think it's important to remember that traditional doesn't mean sort of frozen in time, but traditional systems of governance of land of seeds, of water, of biodiversity that have uh, a lot of pluses and connections to positive outcomes. And so being able to expand those regimes while still paying attention to the fact that many of them do have their own flaws and inequalities. So there's a lot of research around indigenous uh, land regimes 
but the need not to take for granted that they might be superior in some ways, but they often still have gender inequalities, caste inequalities. So those have to be addressed very carefully, but uh, we know there's a lot of potential from these factors if we really recognize this and, and deal with distribution and power around these uh, access issues. Um, so knowledge and culture, these, and so all these sections in the report which um, have, are quite fully fleshed out and again trying to make sense of what are the disabling factors and the enabling factors, so we're just giving you a flavor of them and then there's also case studies of kind of examples where the, the, these dynamics are playing out in territories in different parts of the world. Um, and so one of, so in regards to knowledge and culture, people talk about agroecology being uh, knowledge intensive rather than a capital intensive form of agriculture and um, knowledge is often presented as being fundamentally important in agri agriculture and agroecology. Um, and so when we think about knowledge, we think about different knowledge processes that are in play, as in the knowledge processes that are kind of bound up in the traditional and, and indigenous practices of people and farmers and local ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge. But we also think about things like ex agricultural extension, we think about research processes, we think about um, education systems, primary, secondary, post-secondary, and all of that is kind of this this kind of this domain of of transition that's really important to think about. And so when we think about some of the the disabling factors, if we understand the importance of local, indigenous, traditional knowledge, that it, across all of those those different areas, knowledge processes, that there's a um, kind of a dominant. Um, a dominance and a power that's held up in whose knowledge counts and whose knowledge is is marginalized and whose knowledge is supported in, in, in and across these systems. And so when you look at um, the way that kind of public funds for agricultural research are uh, distributed and, and used, often it's, it's for, it, um, it marginalizes the importance of those knowledge systems and it holds up elite academic Western knowledges in ways that undermine the emergence of agroecology. In terms of the effect in this domain, we think about the way that extension is often extending knowledges from elite knowledge centers of power out and imposing them in different places in different ways, and how that's all bound up in in a kind of politics of knowledge that prevent agroecology. Um, we also can think about um, uh, the kind of on the flip side of that, the emerging kind of counterpoints and alternatives around efforts to democratize knowledge and to engage in an approach to knowledge that, that challenges some of those assumptions about whose knowledge counts and, and what knowledge is important for um, developing agroecology. And so we have efforts around participatory approaches to knowledge, around transdisciplinarity, around, kind of a, 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 around an approach that values and recognizes the importance of, of local traditional ecological knowledge, both in the way that extension works, and so it's, you know, thinking about People who work in the the, uh, the the business of extension or the profession of extension, be not being about extending knowledge out that starts from an elite center of knowledge, but that seeks to facilitate processes of dialogues of knowledge um, that can enable agroecology and enable different forms of knowledge to come together to develop agroecological systems. And so, if you take that even further, and this is again rooting it back in a place of power, is that if if we those those processes are often uh, kind of really powerful. There's also um, to mention the, the kind of farmer to farmer, campesino to campesino processes of knowledge production, mobilization within social movements and within communities where there um, where there's knowledge being created or, or across horizontal networks and, and used to develop agroecology, and all of those are are really important. But to take it even further is just to think about um, how those knowledge systems are again. Um, infused or shaped by um, the politics of, of wider society and the kind of colonial politics of knowledge where we have to think about how patriarchy and how racism and how heteronormativity and all these different dimensions of power even shape any efforts to democratize knowledge because democratization doesn't happen in a vacuum but we have to understand these kind of world historical systems and local systems that prevent that. So these are the things that we're playing with in this domain and trying to make sense of across the literature. And I'm going to pass it to Sheila next. So the, so the next one is discourse. And uh, in this section, we looked at how discourse can constrain or uh, mobilize different actors to transition to more sustainable food systems through agroecology. 
Uh, in order to unpack this aspect, we relied on three concepts. Uh, one is discourse, the other is frames, and uh, finally the discursive arena. So this course uh, represents how we communicate about people, things, and the way in which society is organized. It reveals usually how we think about the world and how we make sense of it. And usually it's, it's perceived to be verbal, but it can also be uh, non-verbal. So sometimes the way in which people act also reveals um, how they, what they think about the world. And we felt that this course is important because it can provide uh, legitimacy to certain forms of uh, knowledge or action, or in our case, transition pathways to more sustainable food systems. And as such, it can be a powerful mobilizing tool um, to inspire people to act in particular ways or to adopt particular uh, transition pathways. The next one is frames. So uh, frames are an interpretation that condense and simplify uh, issues, so in our case agroecology, and frames can reveal uh, usually our ideological positions and worldviews, uh, in this case about agroecology, in, in the sense that we will all tend to emphasize certain aspects of agroecology rather than other aspects of agroecology. And finally, the discursive arena is really useful in reminding us that different actors with different positions and different power um, will advance different framings of agroecology. So they're interacting in the, this what we call discursive arena, and they try to um, contest and negotiate different readings of reality and press for different outcomes in terms of different transitions, uh, the different transition pathways um, to agroecology. Um, in terms of actors, we try to look at discourses by governments, by the FAO, by social movements, researchers, um, and the media, and private, actor, uh, private, act, private actors. And uh, yeah, as you see, we found, I think, five enabling uh, frames and, and four disabling ones, and there are probably more. It's just that in the course of this, over the course of this project, these are the ones that we've been able to identify. So for the enabling ones, there is cultural resonance, holism, valuing family farming, participation, and then the cluster of food sovereignty, autonomy, and the rights-based approaches uh, to food and agriculture. And in terms of the disabling frames to agroecology as we have defined agroecology, or in some cases to agroecology as such, uh, are trivialization of smallholders, compartmentalization, feed the world, and weak ecological modernization. So I guess some of these are maybe more obvious than others at a first glance, but uh, we can maybe in the conversation uh, part, we can, we can unpack them a bit more. It's just to say that this section was really important in, in really confirming that there are different, um, although agroecology is increasingly being presented as a federating concept, there are different meanings of agroecology and also different, different transition pathways. Uh, to more sustainable food systems. And this also has clearly governance implications. So the way that this transition is being organized and who participates in it and who shapes it um, clearly has implications for, for governance as well. Uh, so we've gone through a couple of these in detail, um, uh, but we can then expand uh, more in the conversation. So I'm going to be relatively brief on a couple of them as well. So. On the equity domain, I think there's just, not just, there are four perhaps key points I could make. Uh, one is that agroecological approaches have often been linked to improved uh, gender equity and other axes of uh, improved equality. And it can be a form of a re self reinforcing link where uh, improved empowerment, improved equality can actually improve the uh, outcomes of agroecology. At the same time, it's not automatic. We can't just assume any agroecological agro intervention increases equity. So they can be reinforcing, but that doesn't obviate the need to really focus specifically on uh, axes of inequality like race, uh, class, caste, uh, religion, and gender particularly. Um, that said, increasing equality, especially gender equality, has been linked repeatedly around the world with a lot of positive outcomes, particularly in agriculture in terms of uh, increased productivity, uh, increased food security, uh, improved child uh, nutrition results, so it is a really powerful uh, enabling factor when we do address it well. And conversely, the encroachment of large-scale commercial and capitalist systems have been repeatedly tied to 
worsening axes of, of equality. That doesn't mean, of course, that before that they had some kind of perfect gender equality at all, but usually the inequalities have been exacerbated with the introduction of these other regimes. And correlations have been found between increased use of um, agrochemical inputs and increasing gender inequality, for example. But uh, the last big point is that uh, at the same time is that we have these, uh, I would say, very well established repeated patterns and connections that the context specificity is still, of course, paramount. That how you address gender, how you address class inequality, caste inequality, is going to require the specific voice and participation uh, with the community in any particular place. How you approach it, uh, how you address it, how you approach it, is going to have to be very context specific, even though the pattern is, I would say, very, the overall pattern is very consistent. And so um, quickly, we're going to go through the last two domains. We decided to be concise on these ones because we more fully articulated the ones before. So the one on systems of exchange, and Michelle already mentioned, thinking about systems of economic exchange, including markets, but also uh, subsistence, community exchange, sharing, gifts, economies, and so forth, has been really important, obviously, for agroecology and for the emergence of different forms of, of, um, of rural life and urban life and, and agriculture. So. Um, when you think about the way that often long scale, large um, uh, uh, market systems require homogenization in large volumes of products, this is just one example of how the imposition of the dominant regime is to uh, reduce opportunities for agroecological farms to match up with that. So agroecological farms, for example, might, might be on a smaller scale or produce more diversified products and fit very poorly into the, the kind of market systems that are that are being developed um, through the dominant regime. On the other hand, there's a, all sorts of emerging alternatives and also alternatives that have existed in societies for a very long time, like gift economies and subsistence economies, but also um, new kinds of, some people refer to them as nested markets or alternative markets, short food chains. There's all sorts of different ways that people are describing and talking about these things. And all of these are potentially, and in many cases, being found to enable the development of agroecology, um, not without their challenges as well, because of their, in part because of their, they're situated in, in this, um, these alternatives within this dominant regime. So that's just generally the market section. The, the next one is the idea of networks, and, that, and networks, if you look across a lot of the so, socio, social and kind of political uh, folk, um, research and, and work on agroecology, is networks are, are common across almost all of them. The importance of local organizations, social movements, networks that connect consumers and producers, not just for food, but also politically and socially, are very important. Um, and so you have all of these, these existing networks in and across communities and territories, but then you also have kind of a, a movement to, to kind of thicken and, and um, strengthen those networks through the movement for agroecology, the movement for food sovereignty. And so you have these enabling um, efforts to strengthen networks as a, as a culture on which agroecology can grow, which is something that our, our colleagues at EcoSir talk about in a really great paper that you should check out. It's, it's, uh, we, we rip off of a lot of their, their material. But then on the other hand, we see all sorts of ways that the dominant regime is eroding networks and local organizations, um, the individualization of societies, the um, the repression of, or, of, people, of people coming together and, and, and working collectively, the direct undermining of NGOs that do political work, for example, or that do work that in any way contests the, the dominant or the narrative that, that governments are, are putting forth. Um, the division of agriculture into different commodities and organizing farmers among commodity groups rather than around agriculture and and agroecology as a, as a way of life and a holistic approach. And so, again, these are, in all of these domains, you have these, these two tensions, and underpinning that all is governance, power, and participation. All right. Um, we talked a lot about disabling and enabling processes, um, but we realized that those categories were a bit too true in the same way that talking about an agroecology that conforms to the status quo as distinct to an agroecology that transforms. That's a bit, you know, it's the first approximation. 
And as we progressed in our thinking, we realized we had to be much more nuanced and unpack these ideas of disabling and enabling processes. And this has been a framework we found useful. The way uh, a disabling dynamic can operate would be through containing processes of change. Oh, can I go back? Yeah. yeah. Or it can be actively suppressing change, the examples which Colin referred to. Um, there have been you know, the last two years have been a very dark period for activists for food sovereignty, environmental justice, and agroecology physically disappeared. But equally, you can see this happening in academia, say a department of ecological agriculture has been closed down following pressure from a multinational company. So the suppression can take place in a number of places. Uh, more common is a form of co-optation. That's what we see with agroecology being cherry-picked by climate smart agriculture, sustainable intensification, and locked into a more productive, productivist, growth-oriented paradigm. On the more positive side, the enabling processes that can be supported by a variety of actors, including governments, will be simply shielding transition experiments from that wider landscape. Right, that we referred to, can be actively supporting. Uh, so local procurement schemes, given a big boost to agroecological production, um, decided by governments. Or it can be frankly transformative, deeply transforming the regime, the landscape, etc. So we found this typology useful for thinking in a more nuanced way about what's happening. And they're not discrete categories, the world's messy, <coughs> and often there's a bit of both or you know, it's, uh, it's all tangled up, but that was useful for us. Now, I mentioned earlier that it was very important to think about agroecological transitions across different scales of governments, a multi-scale governance uh, view. But a number of scholars, including ourselves, are saying that the, the important level is increasing the territorial level for transitions and transformation. If we think about, you know, um, watershed management that needs to happen in order to conserve soils and water, or coordinated group action for pest management. That happens, you know, not at the farm level, it happens within a watershed of territory. Similarly, if you think about linkages between farms and local markets, nested markets, um, canteens for school kids or prisons, etc., um, that, that's happening within a locality. And the territorial uh, concept, the idea of territorial development and sustainable territorial development is very, very important, which presupposes forms of governance that actually make possible uh, more endogenous forms of territorial development in which agroecological transition and transformation is central. Um, and increasingly, people are coming to the view that the territorial um, domain is perhaps the best one to think about um, agroecological transitions and what needs to be done to move towards transformation. Okay, okay. now if we view agroecology as, a, as fundamentally a development model that's bottom-up, uh, participatory, um, democratic, that poses huge challenges for governments. Um, and we have to think very carefully about the architecture of governments, how governments, how decisions are made, where, by whom, and what are the most appropriate forms of governance that can actually support this bottom-up distributed process of agroecological transition and transformation. It's very site-specific. There's a lot of local adaptation. Now that presupposes a particular form of decision-making and support to make possible these locally adapted dynamics. And we concluded that basically there could be uh, two ways um, to encourage governance that supports this decentralized, distributed, dispersed process of agroecological transition. <coughs> One, through strengthening self-managed managed grassroots of uh, grassroots horizontal networks of farms and citizens and their participatory planning their deliberations over the choice of policies and institutions, uh, their research, um, and oversight of what's happening. Similarly, another approach would be to say, well, 
government probably has to change, the government machinery has to change in order to support these distributed, locally adapted processes of change. So it means thinking about how, how you transform bureaucracies, their organization culture, their practices, the training, the reward system, so that governments, municipal governments, local government, national government, is better able to accompany this process of tailing agroecological solutions to different situations as one scales up and beyond territories. So these are huge challenges uh, that hit at the heart of what kind of democracy, what kind of governments do we need? And I think that conversation is inescapable when we talk about transition and transformation to agroecology. <coughs> Uh, but we can come back to that afterwards. Great. And so just to, to kind of summarize and finish up, um, so this is a this is a, quite a lot of material and a big, um, what I guess I'm referring to is a framework, and there's a lot of nuance within it, a lot to talk about, so we'll get to, we'll get to that. Um, but some of the things that I think that we're we're bringing that that are that are important to highlight is one is just the idea of really focusing not on this interface between the enabling and the and the disabling conditions and, and processes and the dynamics within within which agroecology is situated and so that's something that um, that we've really tried to tease out through different case studies and examples and what's been written in and across the literature. The other thing is again the, the idea that there are these different domains and that it's important to think about them and so we've identified six that were important and now we're trying to think more deeply about the interconnections between the domains and because we talk we talk you know when we, you hear us speaking we're talk we're cross referring to one another now we're trying to deepen our thinking and invite you to maybe engage with us on on that and whether it is a useful way to, to make sense of things uh, and this idea of focusing on governance, power, and participation in the center, because you could imagine that flower petal um, diagram from six domains. Well, within each of those domains, you could easily think of technological fixes, things that don't focus, deal with power, don't deal with um, yeah, who's making decisions, where they're making decisions, all the governance issues that Michelle spoke of. And so if you don't put that in that kind of sea of governance and that sea of power and participation, and how, to, how different, different ways to enable different forms of power to be exercised, that we argue that agroecological transitions within the kind of the approach that we've, that we've <coughs> articulated, which is centering the agency and equity of, of people in, in territories, it's impossible to address. And so you'll, you'll find that the solutions and the pathways to transition that are being encouraged and, and developed are developing an agroecology that's very narrowly defined. So, you know, for us, that's a really important bit. And so finally, again, this has been so much work, and there's such a nice group of people working in our agroecology now group, and not just, um, you know, the people that were connected to a core, but this kind of wider network of, of people that we've been engaging with in social movements, in the FAO. We've had a really lovely experience connecting with the FAO and help, helping them and them helping us think through this idea of transitions and transformations. But we're also equally doing all sorts of work with social movements and communities and farmers and other researchers in different places. And so the next steps for us, and we've just been meeting this week to, to kind of strategize and think this through, is how to translate um, some of the work that we've done into things that are really useful for people who are trying to make change in that vision of a political agroecology for food sovereignty. And so we've started to do some of that work as in Taking, we recently published a report on how to strengthen um, agroecology within FAO, which was made largely for people who are trying to understand what the FAO is doing around agroecology and the different uh, kind of dynamics and levers that people could use if they're interested in, in kind of promoting and advancing a, a, a kind of agroecology that centers people and, and food sovereignty. And so you'll see quite a bit from us, and we're interested in hearing about uh, like how useful it is, what are some of the things that we can do to, to kind of take some of this material, which is big and complex, and it's a huge thing to ask about how to transform food and agriculture systems and how we can effectively play a role in working with social movements and institutions and researchers to, to do that work. And, and so that's, that's where we'll leave it now, and we'll open it up for <coughs> dialogue and debate questions and answers, and thanks for, uh, for listening, and nice to present for the four of us.